Good morning, and happy Sabbath to all of you. It is good to see all of you here, and of course, there are some that aren't for different reasons, but it is good to come together with one another in the house of the Lord. And before we begin, I'd like to ask you please to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, each day that passes brings us closer to your return. Help us today to take advantage of the time that you've given us to prepare for your return. Help us today to get a better glimpse of who you are, that we might share that experience with others who don't know you yet. And Father, I pray that your angels will surround this place, that we won't be distracted, but that we'll hear your voice. Father, hide me behind the cross, that the words spoken today will be yours, that the message will be from you, and that you will receive all the honor and the glory, for you and you alone are worthy. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to get this out of the way first. I want to admit that I'm a thief and I'm going to steal your story just to let you know that. Thank you so much for coming and sharing. And as we come together, there are so many different things, so many different things that we could talk about. But the overwhelming problem that we have in this world is that we are separated from Jesus. And if we can come closer and closer to Jesus and come into his presence, he can do a work in us that he cannot do if we remain distant from him. And so I want to tell a story. And again, I'm sorry, kids, you've already heard this one. So, But it's something that I have struggled with most of my life. When we talk about the loving father that we want to come to know, what kind of a picture do we have? And usually it's based on our own experiences in life. And I was young. We had moved around a few times. We had moved to the Tri-Cities. And as a result, we had certain things that we had to do in the Tri-Cities because it's hot and dry there, so we had to change irrigation pipe. And being the oldest boy and the strongest, I was the one who was given the responsibility and held more accountable than the other kids. And my parents had gone on vacation. They don't go on vacation often, or they hadn't, and so it was kind of a relief as one of the kids in the family because if they're gone while well, the cat's away. And he left in charge of uh, the four of us his secretary, his receptionist. And dad was a doctor. And the instruction he gave us at the end was don't embarrass me. I can tell that you all had parents. And so he gave us that instruction, and we all dutifully said yes, we would certainly obey that, and we wouldn't embarrass him, and we would do as we're told. But I was at the age, I was 14, 15, I wasn't driving yet, and I was growing up, and anybody who has had teenagers understands, and if you were a teenager, you would definitely understand that you get to the place where you think you're a little bit wiser than you are. And I had gotten to that place, and I was pretty much full of myself, and as Tanya came out and told me that I needed to go out and change the water, I responded very dutifully, and I said, I'm not going. And she said, you need to do it now. And I said, I'll do it when I'm ready. And she said, you need to go out and get the water changed. And being the obedient son that I was, I said, I will go when I'm ready to go. Now... I need you to understand that my father was a very stern man. He was a very hard man. He was, he was very structured and very disciplined in what he asked us to do. And I would never have spoken to my father like that. 
more, more than once. <laughs> And it would have been the last time I probably ever got to speak to anyone. And I told Tanya, I'll go when I'm good and ready to go. And there's, there, was, there was a fence around the yard. There was a four-foot fence and there was a six-foot fence. And she said, you're going to go now. And she came towards me. Now, I'm pretty good size and she's not. And I'm thinking... All of a sudden, as she's coming closer, I'm realizing getting into a physical conflict with Tanya would not be very wise. And so as she came closer, I jumped over the fence and said, huh, I'll go when I feel like it. And she said these words. She said, wait until your father gets home. How often is it in our lives that we look at the gospel of Christ and yet we, think, we, see, we forget how patient and long-suffering he is and we look at that and we say, wait until your father comes home. And we serve many times out of fear. We serve many times out of the fact that we think that if we don't do what's right, we're not going to get what we want, not realizing that doing it for that reason doesn't change who we are inside. And all of a sudden, as I jumped over the fence and I heard those words, my heart sunk because I knew what would happen when my father got home. And so for the next four days, while my parents were gone, I sucked up to Tanya as much as I could. She had this smirk on her face, and I understood it was too late. But I continued to do it, and I prayed to a God I had no idea existed. I wasn't a Christian then going up. And those four days passed very quickly, and at the same time, really, really slow. The day arrived when my father came home. We lived in a house with a basement, and I had my room in the basement. And I could hear his steps coming down the staircase. And I could hear his footsteps coming down the hall. And he wasn't happy. And he opened the door. He didn't knock. And he came in and he told me to turn around and put my hands on the bed. And I knew at that moment that I was going to get what I had coming. Because what I had done was so absolutely in rebellion to what he had asked me to do. Now God has given us this. And in this, in God's word, there are instructions about how we are supposed to live, aren't there? Very clear instructions. And, and, and one of them is, don't embarrass me. Don't we see that? Because we're to live and we're to demonstrate the character of God if we claim to be Christians. And so I turned around and I put my hands on the bed and I waited for what I knew was going to come. And for the first time, and the, maybe the only time, no, that's not true, but for the first time, he pulled his belt out and he took it back as far as he could and he just let his hand come down against me. And I'm thinking, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. He told me to turn around. <clears throat> he put his arms around me and he said, it's hard being a kid. Join me, if you would, in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Are we there? I want to start with you today in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, and it says this. 
seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So often as we go through this life, there is so much going on. And we know, we truly know, if we're Christians, we truly know there's a God in heaven that we've embarrassed. But this God that we've embarrassed sent his son to the cross to die that we might have forgiveness of our sins, cleansing from our sins, and eternal life as we continue to draw closer and closer to him. And so the Bible from the beginning in Genesis where he pursued them in the garden after they sinned to the book of Revelation which closes the Bible, we're promised that there's a God in heaven who's going to come and change who we are that we might have eternal life forever. This God loves us so much yet he gave his son that his son came down on this earth and lived a life and went through all of the stuff that we go through and yet so often we go to God and we go, you don't understand, it's different for me. The peer pressure Our broken nature, our out and out rebellion because of our selfishness and our pride, and we look at Jesus and we say it's different, and yet he came with the nature that we have, and yet was without sin. Tempted in all points as we are, and yet without sin. Tempted even more than we could ever be tempted, because I could never be tempted to make a loaf of bread out of a rock. And so Jesus came and he offered us the opportunity to know who he is and understand what he's been through so that he is able to meet us where we stand on this earth. And the problem that we find so often is that as we go through this, there's this struggle in us, the same struggle that Paul had. Remember that one? The good that I want to do, I don't do. The bad things I don't want to do, that's what I do. He said there were two natures inside of himself, and we have that same struggle. But the problem is, as we look at that struggle, as we look at the opportunity that we have to come closer to this God, this God that made a difference, we're deceived and we're confused. And beloved, the warfare that we're under truly is a spiritual warfare. It truly is this reaching into our hearts and our brokenness and our selfishness and it tries to get a hold of us. And Jesus said, the ruler of this, this world, the prince of this world comes. And what did he say? He has nothing in me. But Paul found, and I find, and probably you find, that when Satan reaches out, he finds something in us. And so there needs to be this transformation of our character. And one of the things that I've seen and I've heard, because I'm, I'm, I'm constantly listening to the messages in the church, and because of this message I heard, this sermon is today. And in this sermon that I heard, there was a group of people and this young man said that he was so tired of fighting and having the inability to overcome sin that he's found a new way. And that new way is that the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. And Jesus came to give us his spirit in full measure. And that I no longer need to worry about the sins that I'm committing, but I surrender my life to Christ and he will tell me what I need to do. And I want you to understand that if you hear that philosophy, you need to run as quickly as you can in the opposite direction. 
Because the Spirit of God does not dwell in you fully and completely until Christ finishes His work. Otherwise, Christ could pull out the Holy Spirit in full measure now and we'd be ready. But we're warned that as a broken vessel, if the Spirit were pulled out, poured out in full measure, we would be torn apart. There is a work that has to happen, a preparatory work that has to happen in our lives, and we cannot just believe that God is in us working out His will regardless of what we read or what we watch or what we think or what we believe. Ellen White in her day faced a deception called the Alpha. Are any of you familiar with that? The Alpha was not just pantheism. It was not just Kellogg and saying that God was in everything. It was Kellogg bringing on a new philosophy that said, since the Holy Spirit, since God is God and life is from God, God will be in us and we will have the ability to know right from wrong in here. That's the same lie that Satan told the angels in heaven. We don't need the law of God. We are holy beings. And because we are holy beings, we can determine what's right and what's wrong. And Ellen White had this to say. This was from parents, teachers, and students on page 37. The knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ expressed in character is the very highest education. It is the key that opens the portals of, heavenly, of the heavenly city. This knowledge, it is God's purpose that all who put on Christ shall possess. And so we're told that God wants us to have this character that he has. But if God could just put it on us and settle the whole thing, why hasn't he done that and brought us all home? The reason that he hasn't done that, according to scripture, is that God is a gentleman. And he will not force us to become something that we don't want to become. And God says in his word that he wants us to reason with him. But turn with me, if you would to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in chapter 59. The book of Isaiah in chapter 59, because I don't want to give you my opinion, I want to give you scripture, because the only defense that Jesus had when he encountered the devil in the wilderness was what? It is written. And so I want you to see where God says that that's not the path that we're supposed to follow. But now I want to ask you, don't you get tired sometimes? Don't you get wore out? Don't you get frazzled and you think, boy, I sure wish there was an easier way to do this thing? And if you don't believe me, look around in society. We are coming up with easier ways to do things all the time. And as a result, our sedentary lifestyles are making it very difficult to have a healthy life. God said, six days shall thou work and do all thy labor. And we go, yeah, no, we'd rather have a weekend. Give us two days to rest. Matter of fact, on the Sabbath, I think I'll walk in nature today. I don't want to shower and get ready and come to church and talk to everybody else when I can just go out in nature and fish. And so we have, we have become a people that's very focused selfishly. And so this new wave, this new spiritualism is very appealing because now all we've got to do is just receive Jesus Christ and he will talk to our minds and all we've got to do is agree with what he says. So we're in the book of Isaiah. Are you there? The Isaiah chapter 59. Are we there? Okay, starting in verse 1. It says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Now as we look at that, we can come to go to the far other extreme. This doesn't say God doesn't love you, but it says that what you're practicing today is keeping you separate from God. 
It's not saying God doesn't want to come down. We're told very clearly that God stands at the door and knocks and wants to come in. But the reason he can't come in is because of our sins. He wants to come in, and if we'd agree to drop this and get him, he'd come. But as long as we're going to hold on to this, don't miss this, God will continue to stand at the door and knock till some point. So we serve a Savior who's come to us because we can't go to him. And he's saying, I'm trying to come in, I want to come in, but you won't let me come in because you want to hold on to something that I can't agree with. Beloved, today in the church we're told that we want to make a safe place for certain things. A safe place looks like the love of Jesus, which means acceptance, courtesy, respect, and Jesus said that there's supposed to be a watchman on the wall. And that watchman is to declare that there's a danger in sin. And so we come alongside, we love, we encourage, we respect, but if we lose the fact that we're the watchman on the watchtower, we've now lost the job that Christ has given us to do because we're now allowing this group, whoever they might be, to continue to live in sin and not enter into a relationship with Christ because the sin in their life is separating them from God and they cannot have the full relationship that God wants to have with them. Does that make sense? So we need to understand that a safe place has to be a place where we not only accept them and embrace them, but warn them of the dangers that might be involved in their lives. The new movement is to take away that warning. The new movement says we don't talk about sin, we don't look at sin as something that separates us, but we look at the fact that we haven't received the full indwelling spirit of God. Yet God's word says we'll never get that full indwelling until we allow him to become the Lord of our lives. And the Lord of our lives is the master of our lives. And so this is the God that we're looking to know. This is the God that we need to embrace. And so often now in the new theology, we've done away with it because if you stop and think about it, most times if you bring up the law, you're called a legalist. I guess God's a legalist too because it's his law. And so we need to understand that he gave that law to us for a reason. And I think that's the problem that we have. Most of us have this picture of God as this guy with a belt that he takes off every time we do something wrong. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Galatians, because Paul, who talked in Romans about this, this God that wanted a difference and these two natures that were warring inside of him, he wrote the book of Galatians 2, and I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Galatians in chapter 3. The book of Galatians in chapter 3. We're going to look a little bit in chapter 2 also, but chapter 3 is where we're going to start, and then we'll use chapter 2 to kind of explain and define some of the things that we're going to say. Galatians chapter 3. Are we there? Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 22. Galatians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 22. It says this. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Therefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith." But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now that can look to be a little bit confusing. But the very first part of it in the very first verse says we are all under what? See, you've already forgotten that word. You don't like that word, do you? Sin, right? So as you look at the verse, we are all under sin. That's where we start. But the reason we're starting there, if you go to the reason that the Holy Spirit came, we're told that the Holy Spirit came to convict of three things. Do you remember what they are? Sin. Not yet. Sin, righteousness, and then judgment. And then it goes on to explain exactly what those things are for and what they're about. So the Holy Spirit... <coughs> 
pardon me, came to convict us first of sin. Why do we need to be convicted of sin? Aren't you tired of hearing about sin? I mean, I'm tired of hearing about sin, but why do we need first to be convicted of sin? Because if you don't know you have a need, why do you want a savior? And so we need to understand what it is that Christ is there for us. Now, we're told in Scripture, and I've already read it in one of these verses, but we're told, and they use this just as a blanket statement, what do they say? Just believe. Just believe in Jesus. My question to you then is, what do you believe about Jesus? Why do you need to believe in Jesus? And what is it that Jesus is going to do for you? And if Jesus is going to change my life, prepare me for heaven, I'm ready. Do it and let's be done. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to do something in our lives and he came to make a difference and the difference he came to make we're going to see right here because we're all under sin. Being under something means that you're under that particular thing as your master. You are a slave to that. And we're all told that we're slaves to sin. Is that not true? Because of our nature this is what we're bent towards. We're very selfish. And it says in Romans that the wages of sin is death and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? So we understand our condition and Christ died for us while we were yet what? Not just sinners. His enemies. Christ died for us while we were yet his enemies. So here's this God who's going to pursue us even though we don't love him. Even though we don't care for him. And we're told in Romans that the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. So it's his goodness, his pursuit. It's not ours. And as his continued searching after us and the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. So we are all under sin. And this is the first thing we need to remember because remember, Christ died for the ungodly. Praise God. Because if he died for the righteous, I'm lost. So Jesus died for the ungodly and so we need to understand that we are all under sin because this is where we are without Christ. So it goes on, it says, the scripture has concluded that all are under sin. We accept that now. <clears throat> that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So we need to understand we're under sin and what we believe is that Christ came and died for our sin. Number one, we don't have to pay the penalty. But number two, to cleanse us from all sin. 1 Timothy 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. So we need to understand there's a purpose that we believe in Christ because he is going to forgive us and he is going to cleanse us, which means there must be something in us that's dirty. And Christ wants to take that away. And so Christ will work and it says that we come to him that we might be given to them the promise, might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, I want you to notice that because this faith that saves us, before faith came we were kept under the law. So at one point we're under sin and sin is our master. We're a slave to sin. The next thing is we're under the what? We're under the law. So now the law is our master. The problem with that... If we leave it right there and stop right there, go to chapter 2 and take a look at verses 16, 19, and 20. It says in verse 16, chapter 2, in Galatians, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. So if you're under the law, can you be saved? It says that it can. And if you go on in 16 or 19, it says, For through the law I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. So we need to understand that the law can't save us, but from one point when we're under sin and its dominion. The next point we're under the law. Why? Because the law convicts us of sin and it does something else in the very next verse. It says this, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law is a teacher. The law is something that directs us to Christ because the only salvation we have is in Christ. 
But now, I want to ask you a question. Are you saved by faith? You're not going to answer me. Come on, it's not really, well, I mean, it kind of is, but it's not really a trick question. What's that? <clears throat> if you go across a bridge or a bouncy board over a hole full of mud, you're going over that board because you believe that it'll get you across. Is that not true? No, because you're a chicken. But because we think the board will hold us, we'll start. We may run into difficulties along the way, but I want you to understand something here, and I want to say this very clearly, and I want to be very careful. You are not saved by faith. Nobody's going to say anything. All right, let's look it up in the Bible and see if I'm right or I'm wrong. I agree. Well, thank you very much. I want you to turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, because Scripture is going to tell us. Now listen, I said before, I don't want you to listen to these philosophical arguments because the only thing we can stand on is what? The Word of God. Is that not true? So Ephesians chapter 2, are you there? Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to start in verse 8. And you all know this. For by grace are ye, what? Saved. So what saves you? Do you understand? Because this is the thing I think we miss most of the time. What is grace? What's that? But I want more than that. I want you to look at this from, from Titus chapter 2, verse 9, 10, 11, right in there. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that living soberly righteous lives in this day, in this day. So the grace of God that bringeth salvation, and you're saved by grace, teaching us. So there's a power and a force in the grace of God. But most people just want this grace of God that says, eh, live like you want. My grace is sufficient for you. It doesn't matter whether you allow me to work in your life or not. Do you understand? We're not saved by faith. We're saved by grace. It's God's grace that works in us and through us and changes us. Where does faith come in? When God says and lives in you and tells you to move forward by his word, not some imaginary word that you've just heard out of the heavens, we by faith believe that we can trust Christ in every particular, in every way, for everything we need, that we might be saved by our faith in trusting him and allowing his grace to work in our lives. Grace is something that moves in us and we have to allow God to have his way in our lives or we're left to our own devices and so we're saved by grace through faith and now read the rest of the verse it goes on and it says this for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast we're not saved by the law but for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them beloved we're saved by a God through the power of the indwelling work of his Holy Spirit in us and it is the goodness of God as we see the true picture of faith, as we see the true picture of what God is like. It is that that moves in us and through that love for him, we allow him to do the work in us. We're told that many will be lost, many will be lost because they lack a love of the truth. Not because they lack a knowledge of the truth, but because they lack a love of the truth. We can't become Christians who believe all of these things about God, yet don't love the God that all these words point to. And so Jesus wants to do this work in us. That's his purpose. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Turn with me. We're almost done. Isaiah chapter 1. 
if God's grace is going to do something to us, and if the Spirit of God is going to convict us of sin, righteousness, who's righteousness? The righteousness of Christ. And so if the Spirit of God is going to convict us of that righteousness, it says in the next verses that that righteousness is the fact that Christ has gone back to the throne of his Father. Christ came down and lived a life as a human being and now, according to Scripture, we're convicted of sin because we have fallen short of the glory of God. We're convicted of righteousness because Christ has returned to the throne of the Father. <clears throat> and we're convicted of judgment because the prince of this world is going to be judged. We need to understand that this process that God wants to work us through is found right here in Isaiah. And Isaiah has been here from the Old Testament all the way through to the New. It's been through Genesis all the way to Revelation. And as we look at Isaiah and we look at chapter 1, it says this in verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God has said in his word that he wants us to sit down with him and reason with him and work from cause to effect. He wants us to understand that it's his indwelling power, it's his grace that changes us, not the works of the law, but we must sit with God and reason that our sins that are keeping us separated from him, we need to understand and we need to give those sins up. You know... My lovely wife is a very gracious, gracious person. And I, as Tanya found out, am not. And there are times when I want to have my own way. Now, I know none of you are like this, so you can kind of ignore this analogy, but I just want you to understand that I find myself wanting to have my own way. And my lovely, soft, compassionate, beautiful wife just absolutely drives me crazy to the point where I get angry, furiously angry, because what she wants is so reasonable. Right? Now, I want you to stop and think. What Christ wants is so reasonable. But in our brokenness, we get very angry at wanting or, ex or, or him expecting us to do things his way. And so we get angry and we rebel and we go the other way. And my wife, she'll sit there and she'll just, and she'll go, well, honey, and, and she's right. Oh, I hate that. I mean, let's be honest. Don't you hate it sometimes? And she'll say, well, let's do this. And I'll say, fine, we'll do it. Now, did I actually change? No. no. And beloved, sometimes we give in to God and we don't actually change. We just, we give in because we don't want the hassle, we don't want the punishment, we don't want whatever it is we don't want. We just give in and we just go their way. But we're really still not walking together with Christ. And so you can't just sit back and let the Spirit tell you what to do. Because in our hearts, that's not what we want. I want to read this quote. I want to read this quote. And there were many more that I brought that I'm not going to read, but I want to read this one. And this is written in Sermons and Talks, page 343. And this was written at the time of the Alpha apostasy. And this was in direct response to what the teachings were. And see if this doesn't resonate with you about how we're talking about what we're talking about today. Thus I worked and suffered in my girlhood. And all through my life I have had the same errors to meet. Though not always in the same form. In Living Temple, and that's the book that Kellogg wrote... 
the assertion is made that God is in the flower and in the leaf, and this is the point I want you to understand, and in the sinner. This is this Holy Spirit that we just accept and believe that Jesus is going to come. His Holy Spirit's going to come into us. We don't have to worry about anything anymore because the Spirit's going to direct us and our heart now is going to respond to this spiritual change. And this is what she says. But God does not live in the sinner. The word declares that he abides only in the hearts of those who love him and do righteousness. God does not abide in the heart of the sinner. It is the enemy who abides there. Now I want you to get this too, and I want you to be very careful to hear what I'm saying. Anybody who takes one verse, one statement from the spirit of prophecy and builds a whole theology on it is doing the wrong work. Does that make sense? So I want you to hear what she said. And I want you to put it with the rest of scripture. She's saying, as Isaiah said, your sins have separated you from me. The Spirit does not dwell in the sinner, but Christ stands at the door of your heart and knocks. And Isaiah said, let us reason together that your sins that are as scarlet, your sins that are separating you from me. Let's discuss this that you might see, that you might see even though you're a sinner, I died for you while we were yet enemies. I already died for what you don't want to give up. And I'm going to stay here as long as it takes for you to see who I am and make a choice. God stands at the door and knocks. But we have to make a choice. And we have to let him in. And we can't under our own power or our own philosophical events, we cannot change who we are. And that's the new theology. And Ellen White said she trembled when she saw that and what the people had to meet. We need to understand that God is at the door and he's knocking. And what we're holding on to is separating us from him. But don't forget that we serve a God that asks once. We serve a God that continually comes back over and over, is long-suffering, patient, that none should perish. He knows where our hearts are. He knows how to reach us. And we will go through trials. We will go through persecutions. We will go through a testing time. And beloved, do not accept that you can sit there in the pew, glance at God's word, take one scripture and say, I believe in Jesus, therefore my heart will save me. It sounds good. It sure feel good. I'd sure love to think that I'm perfect and just waiting for God to dust some of the stuff off out of my life. Jesus is about ready to come. Jesus is waiting for a people that he can call his own. A people whose hearts have been opened to him, not because of fear, not because they know it's the right thing to do, but because they love him and they love what he wants to do in our lives. And that doesn't make us legalist. But it still allows him to be God and us to choose where we want to be. Wouldn't it be terrible if I give in to my wife and I say, fine, we'll do it, only to be living in hell for the next how many ever long it takes because we really didn't want to go there? But we serve a God who knows that. We serve a God who wants to touch each of our hearts. Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, as we come down to the end. Two more scriptures and very few words from me. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, and it says this. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
people misunderstand that. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The scripture says that God will work in you both to make you willing and to help you do. We're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Not fear of God, but fear that the nature within us is going to keep us separated from God. And it's that fear. It's that being afraid. It's that not... It's that fear of realizing that within us there is no power, but thank God through Christ Jesus there is. And that's what Paul said. So that fear and trembling isn't this fear of God's judgment, but it's this fear that I might raise up and not allow God to be God. Don't be afraid of God. Be afraid of our brokenness. <laughs> Understand there's no safety there. And let God work both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I want to close with this from the book of Acts. The book of Acts in chapter 2. Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen? Do we really believe that? Do we really hope for that? Is that what we're really looking towards? Well, here they are in the book of Acts. And Jesus now has gone. And this is the instruction that Jesus gave his disciples and all those that were waiting in the upper room. He said, go there until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In today's age, we come and we were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. But Jesus gave them something that they needed to do. And it was a three-step process. And it starts in the book of Acts in chapter 1. But I'm just going to close with it in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And this is what happened. After they had finally agreed to come together, after they had finally agreed to break bread together, because we can come together but not eat together, after they finally agreed not only to come together and break bread together, but to go out and work together from house to house, as they finally agreed to do what Christ asked them to do, there was still one more thing that had to happen, and it happens right here in chapter 2. And I want you to see this, and I don't want you to miss this point, because this is what it's going to take for us to be prepared for Christ to come. This is what it's going to take for Christ to pour out his Spirit in us that we might have not just the power of God's Spirit, but the presence of God in our lives, and we might be changed into his likeness. In the book of Acts, in chapter 2, it says this, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. I want you to finally, I hope, see this and perhaps a different way and this goes with scripture when Jesus came and took the form of a man it says he did not think it robbery to be equal with God is that right and yet even though it did not appear to him to be robbery to be equal with God he still took the form of a servant and a man he humbled himself even to the death on the cross Christ, in the Garden of Gethsemane, surrendered his own will, took the shame of sin upon himself, became sin for us, and he humbled himself from the position of God to the position of the lowest possible life form on this earth. And he told them to go into the upper room until they were prepared to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And beloved, it wasn't the fact they went into the room. It wasn't even the fact that they confessed all their sins. Because remember, I told my wife I'd go. It was the fact that in their hearts they finally recognized to esteem the things of others as more important than their own. They finally recognize that for the good of Christ, they would endure the shame of being called names. They finally recognize that their worth 
was only valuable in the eyes of heaven as they emptied themselves of self. And it was only when they were emptied of self that the Holy Spirit could fill them with the fullness of God. We don't receive the Holy Spirit because we're tired of being beat up. We don't receive the Holy Spirit because we just want God to show us a better way. We receive the Holy Spirit when every part of our being is humbled. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up.